Conflict is the realm of uncertainty. Yet, even in conflict, business remains. Beneath the guns of the Tigray conflict, the Sinai militants, the Yemeni battle space, and the political machinations of Khartoum, an additional development is coming to maturity. At at least 3 million square kilometers, the Arabian Nubian Shield constitutes one of the largest Precambrian rock formations globally. It spans nine countries and stretches from the eastern coast of the Red Sea into the Saudi highlands. It is an exceptional place that holds tens of millions of tons of minerals, including copper, tin, tantalum, niobium, chromium, nickel, and above all, gold. Now, as diplomats meet to resolve the crisis in the Horn of Africa, backroom deals between mining conglomerates and national partners are being struck. At stake is not merely the future of mining in Northeast Africa, but the survival of governance in a region of prolonged conflict. By and of itself, the long-neglected Arabian Nubian Shield is poised to become Africa's next big mining destination. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Today's video is sponsored by Rise of Kingdoms Lost Crusade. The shaping of civilizations is a complicated, delicate process. With Rise of Kingdoms, you get to experience some of that on your mobile phone. As a strategy game, you can choose between a dozen civilizations, including Rome, China, Arabia, and the Vikings. Each faction has its own unique architecture, units, commanders, etc. Personally, I go with the Vikings because Norse mythology is captivating and their units look neat. In Rise of Kingdoms, you collect resources, develop technologies, build your cities and train your armies. And when the time and need arrives, you can use your assets to dispose of your rivals. The world map is huge though, about 100 million players partake in the game, so you would do well to establish alliances with other players across the globe. Download Rise of Kingdoms with the link in the description, you'll get the chance to win an iPhone 13, AirPods Pro, etc. And use the promo code to claim in-game props and start building your empire. Tucked in between Africa and Asia is a unique geological space known as the Arabian Nubian Shield. Millions of years ago, oceanic crust and continental plates collided, separated and back. The earth folded onto itself and gradually forced would-be strategic resources towards the surface. What emerged is one of the largest exposed areas on earth for basement rocks. It is here, in the arid mountain peaks and valleys of the Arabian Nubian Shield, that ancient Egyptians discovered vast deposits of gold and then used those resources to craft their civilization. In the great chronicles of human history, few resources have swayed the hearts of men so much. Gold echoes through history and culture with a unique resonance found only in resources vital to survival, such as water or grain. As a driver of conflict and peace, gold has almost no parallel in its durability or malleability. With gold comes the ability to make or topple governments. Even today, gold reserves, much like arms and diplomatic prowess, are vital to the survival of states. Gold remains a crucial store of liquidity, a store of value. When other investments seem too risky, or when inflation is on the rise, or when the US dollar appears to decline, gold is the best bet you can make. And when it comes to gold, the Arabian Nubian Shield is one of exceptional potential. The belt of metamorphic and metavolcanic rock is split in two. There is the Arabian Shield, which sits east of the Red Sea and expands into the Arabian Peninsula. The range extends from Yemen in the south through Saudi Arabia to Jordan in the north, touching upon Israeli and Palestinian territories further down the line. The second component is the Nubian Shield, which is west of the Red Sea and extends from Egypt to Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia and Somalia. Although these nations differ greatly, the territory of the Arabian Nubian Shield shares similar geological properties. 
while the region is best known for its gold deposits, with modern technologies and more extensive excavations, vast sums of mineral resources have been mapped over the years. It's not just gold anymore, but copper, tin, zinc, nickel, iron, silver, platinum, manganese, uranium, tantalum, niobium, phosphates, cobalt and chromite. All materials deemed as strategically significant by militaries across the globe. Chromite, for example, is necessary for the production of chromium superalloys, which is a material that forms the basis of jet turbine engines. Tantalum, another example, is a component vital to household electronics, while niobium is used to strengthen alloys at low temperatures, making it sought after for use in rockets and missiles. Though much of the Arabian Nubian shield remains underexplored, there is a benchmark to measure the overall prospects. In the Saudi portion, decades of exploration by various organizations and companies has led to the discovery of more than 5,300 mineral prospects and occurrences. Since the Arabian Nubian shield shares the same geological evolution, it is believed that the other nations hold undiscovered mineral sites in proportion to territory. If true, the Arabian Nubian shield could be Africa's next big mining destination, if not the world's. Securing a market share in the Arabian Nubian shield would come with immense wealth and international bargaining power. However, wealth and resources means little in the face of poverty in governance. Many of the nations in the Arabian Nubian Shield can attest to that. Internal disunity and economic mismanagement form a pattern that dates back centuries, a classic case of the resource curse. For instance, in Sudan, the ease of access to gold deposits has provided insurgents with the funding to acquire weapons and confront the central authorities. On the other hand, it has also provided paramilitary forces loyal to the previous government to retain their influential positions in the post-revolutionary landscape. But it's not just Sudan. Further south in conflict-ridden Ethiopia, Canadian mining companies such as East Africa Metals Incorporated and Parallel Mining Corporation are already eyeing the spoils in the Tigray region. And it's not just Canadian companies. The list of active players includes China's Zhejinshin Mining, Israel's ICL Group, South Africa's New Kush Exploration and Mining, Australia's Sub-Sahara Resources, and so on. Up until a few years ago, much of the prospects in the Arabian Nubian Shield had been locked away for geopolitical reasons. There are active deposits, mainly in Saudi Arabia, Eritrea, and Egypt, but much of the region has remained underdeveloped. Now, all that is changing. One of the world's most promising mineral regions is opening up for business. It hasn't happened yet, but the legal foundations are being set up. In Cairo, post-revolutionary economic stagnation has pushed Egyptian lawmakers to overturn long-standing legislation discouraging foreign investors from setting up shop. Under the previous law, exploration licenses were granted as part of a joint venture with a 50-50 production sharing agreement with the Egyptian Mineral Resource Authority. But as recently as January 2020, Egypt introduced new legislation that removed the joint venture requirement and further reformed its revenue model to focus on application fees and royalties. Further south, the potential remains just as high, yet the future grows even more obscure. With the removal of Omar al-Bashir's government in 2019, the transitional Sudanese government began to normalize relations with the United States. Coinciding with this change was the lifting of sanctions that had been in place since Khartoum's designation as a state sponsor of terrorism in 1993. Sudan is the third largest exporter of gold among African nations, despite its industry being dominated by artisanal mining. Nonetheless, the situation remains unpredictable. The recent military coup in Khartoum risks reversing the developments made since 2019. To the east, in Eritrea, legislative reform is likewise stifled by geopolitical developments. 
Despite liberalizing its mining sector in 1995, Eritrea's pariah status on the world stage leaves it open to sanctions. Eritrean authorities provide arms to regional insurgents such as Al Shabaab in Somalia while intervening in the Ethiopia Tigray conflict. These political commitments continue to ruin Eritrea's international reputation. That said, the country's ease of access to the Red Sea provides it with an economic lifeline. To the west, Ethiopia stands alone amongst the other states of the Arabian Nubian Shield in its extraordinary achievements and catastrophic malfunctions. Having possessed a mining sector relatively more welcoming of foreign involvement, Ethiopia's potential has, in recent years, increasingly drawn the attention of the international mining community. Growth has been particularly exposed in the past five years, with export values climbing from $9.6 million in 2015 to $504 million in 2021. That is a staggering growth rate. Nonetheless, the outbreak of the Tigray War has been a disaster for Ethiopia's standing on the world stage. With international sanctions already enacted and more likely to follow, Addis Ababa will need to find a way to resolve the conflict as soon as possible, whilst saving whatever remains of its stature, lest it faces the same isolation that Sudan faced before the revolution. On the opposite side of the Red Sea, in Saudi Arabia, its policymakers seek to quadruple the mining sector's GDP contribution by 2030, going from $17 billion to $64 billion. Saudi Arabia's mining industry is well placed to support this increased demand. There is enough mineral wealth in the country to help it diversify its economic portfolio away from hydrocarbons. Since the launch of Vision 2030, the state has passed about 400 updates to its policies, including new mining investment laws, streamlining license applications, data sharing to reduce risks that investors could face, etc. Riyadh identifies the mining sector as a potential pillar of its economy, and the state is currently working on ways to develop a mining value chain, a first in the region. All things considered, the potential for economic windfall remains so long as policymakers in all states thread carefully. That is, of course, easy to suggest but difficult to make happen. The states which make up the Arabian Nubian Shield have a fractious and complicated history. Internal instability within one state is often a prelude to settling grievances by an external power. For example, in recent months, as the Tigray conflict has spilled over into Sudan's southern provinces, Sudanese forces have engaged Ethiopian and Eritrean forces no less than 15 times. Meanwhile, Egypt has continued to affirm its objection to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam project, threatening to use force if necessary. Cairo's close relationship with the Sudanese military could stalemate any future diplomatic negotiations with Ethiopia. In this part of the world, one tiny spark can have the most devastating consequences. So, as the Arabian Nubian Shield gradually opens up for business, stability and predictability will be more imperative than ever. Anything less, and the dreams of wealth can just as easily fade, like gold dust in the sand. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. If you approve of what we do, please consider joining our Patreon platform or YouTube membership. Doing so helps us to remain self-sufficient and independent. Thank you for your time and sahol.